The victory Allah granted the Muslims at Badr deeply grieved the pagans. Revenge was uppermost on their minds, and to this end they devised plans to inflict heavy losses on the Muslims. As events show us, Allah, however, turned the tables on the Quraysh and blessed the Muslims with further triumphs and even more prestige. Just one week after the return from Badr, or after two and a half or three months, according to some sources, Banu Sulaim began conscripting an army to invade Medina. In a preemptive strike, the Muslims raided their base and came back with booty. Then, Umar bin Wahhab Jumahi and Safwan bin Umayya decided to assassinate the Prophet, peace be upon him. Umar stole into Medina, hoping to carry out his mission, but was apprehended as soon as he entered Medina. Allah had revealed Umar's motives to the Prophet, peace be upon him, who in turn disclosed Umar's secret plan to him. Umar repented and embraced Islam. Even though the victory at Badr was decisive, it did not spell a reprieve for the Muslims. In fact, each tribe among the pagans and the Jews took it upon itself to keep the pressure up by harassing the Muslim state. The Jews of Banu Gaynuqa engaged in openly hostile acts, and when the Prophet, peace be upon him, called on them to refrain, they retorted derisively, Do not delude yourself, Muhammad, just because some naive fools and simpletons have entered your fold. Should you ever fight against us, you will test our mettle as men of valour. The Prophet, peace be upon him, responded with his customary patience, which brought forth even more provocation from Banu Qaynuka. Banu Qaynuka started a clash in the marketplace which resulted in the death of a Muslim and a Jew. This time, the Prophet, peace be upon him, dealt with them firmly. He ordered the Muslims to besiege the enemy. It was Saturday, the middle of Shawal, 2 AH. After holding out a fortnight, Banu Qaynuka laid down their arms on the night of the new moon of Dhul Qadar. The Prophet, peace be upon him, expelled them, driving them away towards Adra in Syria, where most of them died shortly afterwards. Expedition of Sawik Meanwhile, Abu Safyan was still smarting over the defeat at Badr. He thirsted for another military encounter, one which he felt sure would go their way, and swore that he would not bathe until he had fought with Muhammad, peace be upon him, again. With an army of 200 men, he came to Medina, seeking to acquit himself of his oath. Intent on spreading destruction, they raided a settlement named Arid, hacked and burned a number of precious date trees, and got away after killing two of the Ansar. When the Prophet, peace be upon him, received news of the raiders, he and his followers went out in pursuit. Abu Sufyan and his men succeeded in eluding the Prophet, peace be upon him, who pursued them until Karkarat al-Qadr. In trying to get away swiftly, the Quraysh were forced to get rid of most of their valuable provisions, especially the cornmeal, or sawik, from which the expedition got its name. The next thorn in the Muslim side was Kaab bin Ashraf, an extremely wealthy Jewish poet whose enmity for the Muslims and their prophet, peace be upon him, was unrelenting. Kaab would use his considerable poetic talent to compose and recite derogatory verses against the Prophet, peace be upon him, and his companions, and the honour of Muslim women, while he eulogised their sworn enemies and incited them to fight the Muslims. Immediately after the Battle of Badr, he travelled to Mecca to stir up passions. To an already bloodthirsty and enraged Quraysh, he orated at length, bidding them to extract vengeance for their defeat. Qab was a skilled demagogue, and given the high esteem poetry and poets had in Arab society, his words worked a spell on the Quraysh. His call for revenge was welcome, as was his assurance that the Quraysh were on a higher spiritual plane than the Muslims. He exhorted them to learn a lesson from what had happened with the Banu Qaynuga. The Quraysh were a willing audience, and they swore to act on Gab's advice. Having wound up his propaganda campaign against the Muslims, Gab returned to Medina to continue his subversive acts against the Muslim state. When the Prophet, peace be upon him, heard about Gab's return to Medina, 
he said to his companions, Gab bin Ashraf has offended Allah and his messenger. Who will rid me of him? In response to the Prophet, peace be upon him's call, Muhammad bin Muslima, Ubad bin Bishr, Abu Nayla, Harith bin Aus, and Abu Abs bin Jabr volunteered their services. Muhammad bin Muslima was appointed the head of the mission and accordingly thought up a plan. But since it involved subterfuge, he sought the Prophet, peace be upon him's consent before putting his plan into action. Having received the Prophet, peace be upon him's permission to entrap Gab, Muhammad bin Muslima went to Gab. After Gab's initial wariness had worn off, Muhammad confided, This man, indicating the Prophet, peace be upon him, came to us asking for charity, but he has put us to great trouble. Muhammad bin Muslima's words had the desired effect. Gab exclaimed with joy, By God, you people will tire of him even more in the future. Now that Muhammad had gained Gab's confidence, he requested a loan of wheat or dates, leaving his weapon as collateral. His request was granted. Next came Abu Naila with a similar complaint. He confided that some of his companions held the same unfavourable opinion of the Prophet, peace be upon him, and that he would bring them to Gab, as they were also in need of Gab's help. Gab graciously agreed to meet them at a later date, delighted at having found more and more disenchanted Muslims through which he could hurt the Prophet, peace be upon him. It was the 14th of Rabul Awal 3AH and the full moon was shining down on Gab as he lay with his new wife in his fortress. When the five armed Muslims called out to him, Gab readily went down to see them, disregarding his wife's pleas to take care. He was so complacent about his success in finding collaborators that even the sight of the Muslims' weapons did not startle him. He certainly did not see himself as their target. They set out on a stroll. Abu Naila complimented Gab about his perfume and asked permission to smell his head. Flattered, Gab obliged. Abu Naila sniffed Gab's head and then holding Gab's head in his hands, bade his companions smell the fragrance as well. He asked to do so again, was allowed to smell the fragrance once more. When Garb's head was firmly in his grasp, Abu Naila urged his comrades, seize this enemy of Allah. Instantly, the others struck with their swords, but with no success. Finally, Muhammad bin Muslima used his axe to strike Garb's abdomen. As the axe cleaved his body, Garb died screaming horribly. The sound of the disturbance roused Garb's men, who lit torches around the top of the fort, but they did not find the five men who got away, having silenced their most vocal enemy at last. Garb's death greatly demoralised the Jews. In their newfound sense of discretion, they decided against open warfare upon the Muslims and went underground, and the Muslims were safe for a while from harassment. In Jamad al-Awwal, 3AH, the Quraysh sent a trade caravan to Syria by way of Iraq. They entrusted the caravan to Safwan bin Umayya and were not overly concerned at the risks involved since the route went through Najat, far from Medina and the menace of the Muslims. When the Prophet, peace be upon him, came to know about the Qurayshi caravan with its precious cargo, he dispatched a cavalry of 200 men under the command of Zayd bin Haritha, may Allah be pleased with him. And nudged, as the caravan halted at a spring named Qarda, Zayd and his men swooped down on the caravan and its travellers. Even though the men managed to flee, their possessions fell into the hands of the Muslims, as did the caravan guide, Furat bin Khayyan. The humane treatment Furat experienced at the hands of his captors so impressed him that he became Muslim. When the booty from the caravan was evaluated, its worth stood at 100,000 dirhams. With this raid, the Muslims had inflicted on the Quraysh an economic defeat as devastating as the military one at Badr.